This is Duke University. Um, so this is the second of our three um, discussion panels um, for uh, the summer writing kickoff. And um, I will simply say that um, given a versatile humanist at Duke emphasis on the need for humanists to communicate well, um, it seemed especially important that we included the, the topic of this conversation, which is writing for publics. And as I think you all know, if, you know, for those of us who are paying attention, most of us are at Duke, um, speaking to multiple audiences is becoming just as important for academics as non-academics. So it's just, it's just, we can't understate or overstate, excuse me, how important a topic it is. So um, I'll just go ahead and introduce our three speakers. Um, so our facilitator is um, Laurent Dubois. Um, Laurent is Professor of Romance Studies and History and the Director of the Forum for Scholars and Publics. Um, he is a scholar of Haiti and the Atlantic world. His most recent book is Haiti, The Aftershocks of History, and he's written widely on a great range of topics, including um, the banjo, America's uh, African instrument, and soccer empire, the World Cup, and the failure of France. Uh, he also writes for magazines, including the New Republic, Sports Illustrated, and The New Yorker. Um, also very happy to have with us um, Yuri Ramirez, um, who is a history PhD student, and she is a scholar of Mexican migration. Um, she is a highly engaged and versatile scholar. Um, she writes and speaks for already for um, non-academic audiences, and she's doing a lot of work with pre-college um, students and low-income and marginalized communities of color. And finally, um, we have with us uh, Kelly Alexander, who is a PhD student um, in cultural anthropology. Um, and she is a food writer, um, and she's worked as a consulting editor um, for Severe Magazine. And her work has also appeared in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Newsweek, and many others. So please join me in welcoming our, our speakers. What I wanted to kind of frame, I wanted to frame this discussion around, to some extent, just hearing about the, the ways in which they navigate the relationship between their academic work and more public writing, both of which they do, um, how they think of themselves as scholars navigating these. Um, often I'm kind of a proponent of the idea that we need to, a kind of more multilingual um, graduate education, an idea that, that graduate education should include kind of this more a, a spectrum of writing styles, right, and a way of writing styles. And that in many ways, the advantages of writing for public, for broader public audiences are multiple, not only in terms of exposure, but also in terms of the intellectual benefit that comes from, from needing to articulate things um, to different audiences. And so I hope we can kind of get into that. Um, I do also want to think about and, and for, invite you all as graduate students um, and participants um, to think about the ways in which maybe graduate education isn't serving this need or could serve this need better, how we could envision um, you know, a space in which this could be a, a, a more kind of core part of graduate education. So I'm hoping that you'll also share your, your thoughts and experiences as we go on. Um, but we wanted to just start by, by hearing from both Kelly and Yuri about kind of how they see the relationship between these, these their, their, their work as public writers. Um, we're thinking of that in a kind of broad and capacious way um, and what publics mean in a capacious way. So um, maybe we can start, Kelly, with you if you want to talk about how you've how you've done this and think about it and navigate it in your own work? Um, yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question because I, I came from a world of public writing first before I was in the academy. I worked, I studied journalism all the way through, but not even traditionally. You know, I studied food first. My mm. whole learning environment, I was like one of those little kids. I spent my whole life in the kitchen growing mm. up, and that was my education, that you could have a career writing about food. I didn't even occur to me until much later, because at the time, you know, I grew up in, in a moment where um, food writers, or to write about food was to like work for a newspaper and to be a very old person. And what happened is that how people got to be food writers was like, that was like the job where you were put out to pasture at the end of your career about writing about like something really exciting like being a foreign correspondent, and then when you retired, you could come back and be a food writer. But all that changed when I was kind of coming up because a lot of stuff was happening in the world, like the internet and the food network. And so then it became possible to be a food writer mm -hmm. and to have knowledge about food that you could translate into writing before you had to like have this whole breadth of a career before you. And so it was easier for me to take that knowledge that I had acquired as a very small person and try to make a career out of it. And so, I mean, when I think about my very first writing for the public, mm -hmm. I was a journalism student, I was participating in um, 
an essay contest for an internship at a magazine in New York. So all these magazines, 400 magazines at the time. It seems like amazing now. I don't even think there are 400 magazines. At the time, there were like 20,000 magazines, big and small, trade and mass. Um, and so I wrote an essay about the topic was, what is something you can do well? And I wrote about making an omelet because it's something I could do really well. <laughs> I watched Julia Child do it when I was really little. I watched my grandmother do it millions of times. I was doing it like in an age when I would not let my children turn on the stove by themselves. So I wrote this essay in one of the magazines that was participating in the competition was Food and Wine. And of the 400 essays, mine was the only one that was about food. So I was invited to this life-changing <laughs> internship there where I discovered it was possible to have a career writing about food for the public. But in my mind's eye, I was an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. always doing that already. I was going into people's houses and kitchens and into restaurant kitchens. And I was being a participant observer. And mm -hmm. I was taking notes. And I was, I was like a mini Margaret Mead. That's how I saw mm -hmm. myself. And so as I got along in the world of food and things changed rapidly, I wanted to become an actual anthropologist. It took some convincing of the anthropology department here at Duke that I was already an anthropologist. They really were not so sure. And a food anthropologist did that. But I was, uh, I learned about, this is a long answer to your question, but I learned about academic writing later. Right. And the way that, that I carried my idea about how to write things and how to translate things for the general public, I already had when I came in. My challenge was learning how to speak that other language, the language of the academy, and learning how to relate things that a lot of people knew about, like how to make an omelet, to things that not that many people knew about, like affect theory, mm -hmm. which I thought was operational in the kitchen, but how to bring those two things together was my challenge. And then I discovered that it wasn't always perceived as super valuable in the academy to want to write something that a lot of people could read. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was maybe perceived as valuable to want to write something that only like five people could understand. And that was very complicated for me. So my, you know, coming out on the other side, I've just finished my third year of classes. I'm going into writing my dissertation. I have always tried to do these things side by side, mm -hmm. you know, write for the academy and then also figure out how to translate what I was doing, much like translating what goes on in people's kitchens. I always think of recipes as their own language. Mm -hmm. When you say multilingual, I'm like, well, there's recipe writing, which right. is its own code. There's mm -hmm. academic speak. There's journalism speak. I mean, all of these things are always at play in whatever I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, want as many people as possible to have access to the kind of scholarship I'm trying to produce. So that's mm -hmm. a long answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's a great answer. And I think it's, you know, raises this question of the tensions. Um, I mean, I think yours is maybe a, a particularly strong case of having written a lot before, but in many ways, you know, the first writing that most of you have done probably wasn't academic writing, or, or at least academic writing in a professionalized sense, right? So I think most people have a kind of writerly self that they bring to graduate school and then you know, is sort of disciplined or turned. And, and I think that's kind of it, what the relationship is between those. And, and at some point, the desire to write is, at, you know, is that, after all, at the core of a lot of academic trajectories. But it's interesting to see the pain that can be involved with being told, not like that, not like this, or what. Um, and I don't, you know, that's, we can get back to that a little bit more, but I'm wondering how you've navigated that um, as well. It is shocking the things that they have in common, which neither side is really very fond of. You know, my mm -hmm. journalist friends really don't like to hear how much like academics they are and vice versa. Right. However, I have to say that if you're really serious about writing, the level of rejection that comes in both sides is exactly the same. That's right. That's true. So if you're not really and used to... And too, probably. And in cooking, too. That's, that's, exa that's exactly right. It's like you don't make a souffle by not making... A hundred souffles that it's stunk, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's part of the process mm -hmm. is that like willingness to, you know, beat not the poor desk over and over and over with drafts. Mm -hmm. So that kind of training is just super important for, I think, mm -hmm. all kinds of writing. And right. then for me, it's just been, you know, learning the language of writing for the academy and of being able to express myself in a way that required even basic, like citations. I was like, oh, right, right. 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 citation. <laughs> 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 and that that counts, and that how many you have counts, and the mm. kind that counts was like, mm -hmm. OK, I want to learn how to play this, because I really feel that what I have to say is important, or it's mm -hmm. at least important to me to try to say it. Right. So right. That, that's you know, mm -hmm. the tension <laughs> always there in writing. Right. Great. Well, Yuri, do you want to tell us? 
just some opening thoughts and then we'll... Um, I think, like Kelly, I actually studied journalism in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the first writing that I did for Publix uh, was for uh, newspapers and magazines in the Spanish language press in Minneapolis, um, which was very different because at the U of M... At the University of Minnesota, uh, everything that we learned about was in English, right? And the way we wrote was in English and mm. how you, you know, front with a lead and all the graphs and everything was all done in English. And Spanish as a language is all um, like reversed in order. And so mm. even like in a, in a sentence, right? And so for me, it was um, to think about multilingualism even, even now is also for me to think about the use of English and Spanish. Um especially with the work that I do now. Uh, and so I started actually writing for Publix um, and did that a lot. I went, uh, I worked for the Minnesota Historical Society, and so I did public scholarship, uh, public history. And that was a whole different endeavor because it was learning to talk about different facets of Minnesota history in a way that could be accessible to uh, publics that weren't necessarily there yet. Um, so my job as diversity outreach was to uh, to bring in sort of the Latino community, uh, the refugee community that included uh, Hmong and Somali refugees, um, and the Black community to the museum. And so part of that meant like doing exhibits that were in Spanish um, or bilingual uh, and finding other uh, people who were doing that as well um, for different exhibits who could translate them. Um, and so I learned really quickly the importance of sort of being able to craft stories and storytelling in a way uh, that was accessible to a lot of different people and to also tell stories that weren't necessarily mainstream or were not necessarily considered uh, part of like major U.S. history, right? Um, and so when I came to work at Duke, uh, I'm an oral historian, and I think part, and what Kelly said too, I think part of what we do as writers, you also have to be really great like oral communicators, right, and verbal communicators. And so I'm an oral historian, and I go in the houses, I'm very much an ethnographer in some ways, um, where I go into people's homes and talk with them about their stories of migration in North Carolina. Um, and think about then, then it's that moment in which I decide how do I translate some of these words that don't have a translation, right? Or how do I translate these emotions or sentiments that don't necessarily, uh, you know, s sound the same or mean the same thing in English? Um, and so the importance of thinking about how these marginalized communities, um, how these stories are being represented, right? Um, and represented from me, who's, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't think I knew, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college, to go to college, to be in graduate school. Um, my parents are immigrants themselves and have a sixth grade education. And so I think for me, it was also to learn an academic vocabulary that I was unfamiliar with, right? And I think in college, I had a lot of that because I had a lot of great mentors uh, but to be in a place like Duke was very um, challenging at times because I didn't necessarily, the way that I wanted to write my stories and tell my stories was a very different way than the academic prose that we are intended to write, right? Um, and yet at the same time, the communities that I work with will never be able to read my dissertation if it stays in English. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if I translated it, right, or had it translated, they might not understand the academic jargon with which I write, right? Um, and so now, as I'm, I'm a community organizer and, as well, and so much of the work that I do in organizing the Latino immigrant community in North Carolina is based on how I tell a story, right? How I tell a story of myself and why I do this work and how I tell a story of us. Um, and what it means for us to be in the moment that we're in right now. Um, and I think this year has been 
particularly daunting for me to be uh, an historian of Mexican migration to North Carolina and do these interviews and have really close connections with a lot of the migrants that have so graciously shared their stories with me um, and to be in this particular political environment in which their sort of well-beings um, are at risk. And so uh, it seems weird for me to, in some ways to think about the importance of writing when these people are also going through these things. And so to be organizing while I'm writing has actually um, in some ways uh, like soothed, soothed, soothed the whole process, right? Um, because I have found sort of much more purpose in the work that I'm doing and uh, the need to sort of tell these stories. Um, so that I can also work, do the work that I'm doing, right? Um, and so it's been sort of a learning process as I go in the ways that I present myself in an academic space versus a, a more like community-oriented um, and public space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You both do such great, amazing work. So, um, I'm curious to some extent about whether you know you found spaces where you feel like sustained in, in putting these together, right? I mean, obviously, we know that the writing styles are going to be different. There's probably That's never going to be resolved, right? Mm. There's, and each of you, at some point in your lives, will write very academic things mm. and non-academic things, right? But the question is, how do you kind of make that a sort of serene process versus a conflictual right? And I wonder if there's, a, you know, if there's either in terms of mentoring or in terms of spaces in your graduate career that have helped you Think about that relationship. I think most people will experience some kind of tension, um, but it's also true that I think most most academics that want you know have a sense of purpose and what they're trying to do, and there's a sense in, you know that the communication is at some point there's right a desire to um, you know in a sense there's a kind of what's interesting in the, what, when we've done the forum of scholars and publics are talking to academics is like there's a generalized desire to have meaningful communication, right? I mean, and that, of course, is at the base of what most people do. So it's interesting at the same time that people feel like they're running up against these structures. But I wonder if we can, you know, if there's a space for getting beyond the, the conflict and maybe just articulating a way to, to see these things working together. And it's a like kind of a long question, but. No, it's um, a really important question because I, I agree with you. I have heard a lot of people in my own department talk about really the need to reach beyond it and to write beyond it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of worry about the future of all kinds of disciplines right sure. now in the academy, yeah. just worrying about the future of the academy in general of higher ed. And I think this is a way, but it's quite, um, I think people get uh, very habitual about their writing. And it's mm. difficult to think beyond the usual channels or of, of the flexibility or of the curiosity that you need to do that. Like, I don't think of myself in my own head as a food writer. I mean, I'm described that way. I never argue about it. I've been in arguments about it on this campus and beyond. I think of myself as someone who's interested in obsessions. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in people who can't let things go. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested in, in the world of food. It's fine, right? All of I have had an advisor very close to me who said, at some point, you're going to have to learn to figure out how to describe what you do outside of food, and I said, but why would I ever want to do that? I've no, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in those things that um, really catch hold of people that they can't let go of that generally mm -hmm. have to do with way beyond food. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think when you are talking about food, you are always already talking yeah. about politics and class and race mm -hmm. and all of the great themes of living. So to be able to get at your question, to be able to connect something that's going on in the academy to something that the public is interested in, is not mm -hmm. really as big a leap as a lot of people imagine. Right. The bridge mm -hmm. is actually already there. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of being willing to be flexible right. about how you're gonna how you're gonna describe what you want to describe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To be able to think of description as a kind of theory is really helpful yeah. mm -hmm. as a, as a way of sort of approaching that. You know, like I, I'm glad you brought up politics. It's almost like that's a great sort of way. Like I'm working on a big project. My dissertation is about food and waste in the EU in Brussels right now and about people who are working on the ground to recirculate food that is still edible that has been discarded. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work has been on high cuisine, but now I'm working with a bunch of activists who are really passionate about not throwing any food away. Mm -hmm. 
And so to me, it's a natural extension of a lot of stuff that I've been working on, but it involves me being on the ground and doing that kind of work with a bunch of community organizers who are working on not only not th throwing food away, but then who's going to get the food and how they're going to get it and those sorts of things. It becomes, it becomes um, a very anthropological project mm -hmm. that feels to me like has wide interest to a lot of public. So my job as the writer is to figure out how to make that bridge. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, so one more thing you just said, right, which is the idea of description is theory. Part of it's the, the maybe something we're not always good about when we talk about academic writing is thinking about language as always multivalent, right? Right. So in other words, that the kind of, in other words, there's an idea of kind of writing that's sort of direct and surface, but we know that writing works through symbolism. In history, right, narratives can be a form of theorization, description can be a form of theorization. And obviously, in a lot of public writing, that's what you do, right? You kind mm -hmm. of sort of, you tell a story that it sort of, in some ways, might be a little deceptive, sort of deceptively like this is just a story, but obviously the way you've crafted it, it's not just a story, it's an analysis of, right, that all the choices you've made. Um, so I think that's, a, and, and obviously in the political realm that comes up too, right, that there's there's never enough time to tell all the stories, so the story that you tell first, or the, the story that you begin with, right, right mm -hmm. is, is, is a huge choice, right, and how you make that choice. And I don't um, mean to knock academics or academic writing at all. In fact, what drove me to it was, you know, I was working at Food and Wine magazine, and I had this job, this assignment, and the assignment was that Mick Jagger had been in New York. The Rolling Stones had done a concert, and he had been to this restaurant. It had been in the New York Post, and I, my job was to call the restaurant and figure out what he had ordered. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, I just know I wasn't put on the earth for this purpose. There's <laughs> got to be, like, I love it's food and how greater. food connects food to people. This can't, this can't be it. Do you know? And so if I have to write another article called Five Summer Pies, I'm going to die. Like, this is just not, it's not it at all. And so what the Academy has given me is the permission to ask the question, what does it right. mean? Mm -hmm. why, what does it mean and for whom and why is it important? And to have the space unlimited to do that as yeah. opposed to, like, 350 words about this piece of chocolate cake Mick Jagger didn't eat but ordered, right? Like, <laughs> That was hard. <laughs> thinking about why chocolate cake is important in the world is like an amazing thing to get to think about. Yeah. You can't believe it. Right. So. And I mean, I think um, I've been very fortunate at Duke to have a lot of spaces, Laurent, where the, it wasn't a conflictive relationship, right? Um, and not to plug the Forum for Scholars and Publics, but that is where I did my fellowship this year. And I was able to create, right, with the team, uh, different pieces of work and different ways of, of presenting my work um, to a greater audience, right? So we we did two like mini documentaries, um, one based on in, on an indigenous community that I work with, um, who celebrate their Saint Day Festival here in North Carolina, and another based on the celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is the Mexican patron saint. Um, and so in those videos, I was able to capture, you know, in a very different and dynamic way, my, the stories that are in my dissertation, right, or at least a glimpse of the stories that are in my dissertation in a way that's much more accessible, right? And because a lot of the migrants that I work with are not able to, to return to their, um, their homes, their families, like in Mexico, can get these links and mm. watch it online mm. um, and in some way feel connected right to their family or at least like they can see how they're living or they see that they're happy and well and that provides them um, some peace. And so, and I think another moment that was very sort of perhaps one of the most fulfilling times of my career at Duke was teaching, um, teaching undergrads. And I think that was also a moment when I was able to to work on writing, but even just with the students, right? And to sort of take apart the way that they were thinking about and constructing their own stories um, and and work with them in a very sort of one-on-one -on -one way. And I think that um, just as a, as a writer and as someone who's trying to, you know, now to write her own dissertation, um, I think it was really beneficial for me to see what it's like to, to help someone else write a story and construct a story and a narrative um, and what sort of problems they faced and, and worked through with them, right? Um, and so I think it's, it's certainly not always in conflict. I think there are very sort of 
obvious ways in which um, it can be sort of very harmonious. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think I'm glad you wrote the teaching because to me it seems like that's like that's something a pitch for this a very strong pitch, which is that writing for a broader audience is, yes. is very similar to it's teaching. It's very similar to teaching. <laughs> yeah. the, the ability to sort of similar. articulate something um, and the, the same types of skills. How do you take yeah. some? people for whom something is totally new and get them into it and then right. introduce them to whatever compli more complex things you want to do. Right. Um, so I don't think that correlation isn't often thought about enough, but of course I think it's a really important one. Um, yeah. Not to mention the ways in which, um, not to mention the ways in which just that exercise allows you to come back to the more academic writing with bigger ideas. I mean, partly it's right. that it's interesting because there's a parallel, what, right, which is that in academic writing, I mean, I know in, certainly in anthropology you're always being asked how does this speak to anthropological, how does this speak to bigger questions, right? Um, and in some ways, there's no better place to try that out than, than public like, writing, where you say, absolutely. like, well, what's the biggest question I, I can connect this to, right? <laughs> um, and I think that, that's kind of interesting, right? So it seems to me there's all these potential spaces of, oh, yeah. of overlap and harmony, even right. though, as we can discuss more, it's also people tend to feel like there's a conflict right. or tend to be sort of, and I, you know, I don't, when we open it up, maybe people have testimonies about this, but, um, but I think there's a sense of, there's a sense of conflict. Obviously, part of it comes from the idea, the fact, the most common thing, right, is simply that people feel like they will not be rewarded right. for this kind of work, that, right. that time is limited, and that if you can only write a certain number of things, there are things that are going to count, and there are things that are not going to count, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a broader question about how the academy, you know, counts. rewards and treats, yeah. and I think that, that's yeah. a key, and of course it's a core. Um, and for a long time, the kind of basic, you know, the basic compromise about that was to tell people they could be public scholars after they were full professors. Right, right. <laughs> which, which is like not a very useful, you know, like is a terrible, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's not a solution, right? Right. Um, because for one thing, by the right. time someone has spent their right. life not doing that, it's not as if, I mean, some we people can jump can into it, it right? Um, but also, I'll think about all the stuff that's lost <laughs> from right. younger folks, younger scholars right. because of that. Um, but so I don't know if you've had a sense of that. I think that's a, that's an anxiety that comes up, right? Is simply that, and and for, and you and it comes from mentors. Sometimes people say like, "That's all very nice, but you know, my job is to make sure you succeed as an academic, and that means mm -hmm. I'm going to have to say you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing this, right? Right. Right. Um, right. It could be the best of all possible. The best, right. you know, people don't. I think most people do this with with good intentions, right? They're not kind of trying to crush your soul. Dreams. <laughs> they're trying to help you have a career <laughs> they're in just the like, academy. They're like, it would be irresponsible of me not to, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, since we're in the in, in this NEH uh, process of trying to imagine things differently, it's yeah. interesting to, to propose alternative vision. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think, I think, so in, like, in my, in my career, my advice, like, I, I was first an organizer, I think, and I was first um, someone that worked in the community and so I don't think I ever sort of hid the fact that that's what I wanted to do from day one. In mm -hmm. fact, when I came here and I met with my would-be advisor, I told her, hey, where is there an immigrant, you know, organization I can work with in Durham if I decide to move here, right? And that was a big part of the reason why I came here was because I knew there was a large Latino immigrant community. And so for me, like, I have actually never seen my like, I have never seen the things I do as in conflict with each other or even in competition. I think in, in many ways they just complement each other and it, you know, and I have presented, you know, in the same, I just came back from the, the Organization of American Historians Conference and I presented my work on one panel and in another panel I talked about National History Day mm -hmm. um, and working with students on creating sort of these public narratives. And so I, I think for me it has never been sort of this like this either or or this I'm doing this and I'm also doing this like my work is Mexican migration and questions of race and that has allowed me to to sort of speak and write in a in a lot of very different ways and to a lot of very different audiences right um, and so it just means that I just build what I present in a different way right based on every and so I think I've never had, I have certainly seen, especially pro even professors of color that have said, you know, you just need to put, like, you just need to sit down and put your head down and write. And I will never be, I think, that type of scholar because my work wouldn't have purpose if it wasn't, like, working with the community um, or sharing in their lives and in th the problems that I see as, you know, as a collective. Um, and so for me, I, I think that, 
I am only here because I am an organizer. I'm only here because my life is this, right? And so I have just, I have just lived out sort of my own, you know, my own existence, like my own is, is very much founded in like these immigration stories and this work with immigrants. Um, and so I wouldn't be a scholar if I wasn't that person. But then both of you are suggesting that the academic space, you know, opens up other. Oh yeah. So, you know that there's a kind of there's a, there's a gain from that too, right? Yeah. And I mean, no one. Really, the relationship between them is kind of what's what's making possible the work. And we can't expect academics to teach us how to be public or you know what I mean, like because that's not what they were trained to do. And so I've been, I've had wonderful people teach me what it's like to be a, a an amazing academic, right? Um, and likewise, I've had people in my life who have who have taught me to be a great public scholar um, and a great academic, Laurent. And so, uh, and so I think that there, you know, there, you take what you can from different people. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see that as sort of like a, right. it's even more fulfilling. <laughs> and then it kind of becomes, I think you're right, and it becomes like a, you, you can have a more full life mm -hmm. as an academic mm -hmm. and yeah. also as a scholar if you are willing to make those bridges. And I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's teaching was like a great example. I teach a food writing class here at the Center for Doc Studies. I've taught mm -hmm. it for years. And the drum I beat constantly is that if you, if you can, as a writer, um, in any profession that there is, and I have a lot of students who are like, that get that market to manage certificate management certificate. Mm -hmm. They're going straight to eye banking. They take my class because they think of themselves as foodies. They don't realize that it's a writing class, but I keep mm. them in there because my argument is that there is not a profession on earth where being a better writer doesn't help you. Mm -hmm. Where like being able to express yourself better is not going to get your application to the top of somebody's pile. Mm -hmm. And so Duke students like that. Everyone likes that <laughs> rationale. So I get them to play with me about writing about food through that gambit. But the idea is that like and so what do you do to be a better writer? Like the the mm -hmm. first thing I would like to do is like destroy the idea that you have to only express yourself in a five paragraph paper. Right. Mm -hmm. that that's the only way to make an argument, that that's mm -hmm. the only way to, to express yourself. There's got to be a better form, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I challenge them to come up with that. And then also just whatever you can refer to. I have students write a, an argumentative paper to me as if I'm their audience about an ingredient. You can pick any ingredient you want, mm -hmm. but you have to interest me. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you're going to have to draw from some unusual sources. Like, can you look into politics? Can you look into history? What is the great conflict of vanilla in Madagascar? Have you like, how can you, how can you learn something that isn't already there in everything anybody's ever written about whatever mm -hmm. there is? And that's what the, um, for me, the Academy's been really great at, is that it yeah. really broadens the references that you can draw from. Mm -hmm. And it can make you so much of a better writer to have to think way beyond your narrow lane of how to approach something. Right. Yeah. Well, in the question of form, I think, I mean, I think that's the other useful thing, right? I mean, they're, they're, it, the question of why the forms we write in as academics are, are I mean, it's not, they weren't handed down on a stone. You know, they, yeah. they're, they're, they're products of history, right? They're kind of, the, and, they, and they have evolved over time and they've changed over time. So I think there's a way in which that, I mean, just the fact of using different forms can, can take you back to the original form and be like, well, why? Or how can I, maybe I need to work in this form, but how can I tweak it a little bit? How can I push the boundaries a little bit, right? And those sorts of things are, um, so. I think I was just about to open it up for questions and look, who's, look who has a question. Implicitly what you're all recognizing is there isn't a public, there are publics. Yeah. That may be divided by linguistic questions or issues. It may be divided by the specific interest or even obsession. People, there's a segment of people who love food. There's a whole, there's several networks now that, that focus on this on, on cable television. So, so that's one way of slicing public. Um, but, but there are others. And what I, the observation I'd like to throw out is, is that if you, you can think about the academic writer as potentially engaging with different kinds of audiences that maybe you can think of in terms of concentric circles. So it, it, from the academic out, there's the subfield then maybe there's the discipline. Then there, there's a wider group that are still academics, but in different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the, the outermost one, even though it's fragmented and fractured, is the broad public. The observation I'll throw out, which is one we mostly haven't talked about yet in this panel, but is frankly very interesting to me, 
is the group who we might call decision makers. So these are these are not academics unless they're decision makers within an academic setting. Um, but they they actually can allocate resources. They they make decisions in legislatures. They 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 have power. And and that's actually a domain where I think we have opportunities to think more creatively about how to hit that one. That's just an observation. The question is, have you thought at all with the possibility of reimagining what our curriculum looks like? Have you thought at all about what we might include within the core dimensions of doctoral training? Not, not things that people do on the side that maybe they tell their mentor about or maybe don't. <laughs> um, <Mostly dumb. laughs> but, but rather, where there could be opportunities for integrating the hard work of learning how to write for these multiple audiences into the fabric of graduate training. I mean, I like the circles idea, and I think the point about decision makers is important. Although, in my experience, it's more like these funny uh, lines, right? You know, in other words, there are groups of people who are obsessed with things who can transit across, right? And there's a way, and that's where I think the, the publics are. Um, so, I mean, in a sense, the, the way that your work will feed back into activism and choices about activism, which then can affect, I mean, I think on the local level or national level, there's, mm -hmm. there's a kind of key there. But it's sometimes unusual trajectories, right, I think. And I think, um, but at the same time, I think, um, and there is, and then there, to, to the other thing to say is I think there's one thing to push constantly is that to, in terms of the future of the university, like, like the academic world and the university always benefits when there's more of a sense of what it does in the broader space. So in that sense, that broader circle is like, you know, in, is in, in terms of decision makers, I mean, just in terms of decision makers who are like, what should, why should we fund a university? <laughs> you know, it's, um, but anyway, but I, I think, uh, the curricular question is a really interesting one, and I'm wondering if you guys have, you have I have thoughts about that, but I bet you have better I have two. Yeah. <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, I don't think you should be, this is maybe a, this is my opinion. I don't think you should be able to get out of grad school without knowing how to write an op-ed. If you want to talk about how to get to a decision maker, mm -hmm. you want to write about policy, you, you grad student, and your training should be able to have some training in how to do that. And, and make a really powerful argument mm -hmm. that is based on all of the things that grad school gives you, which is some knowledge of history in the past and theory, and then take that and tie it down to something that's mm -hmm. very practical that's happening today. And so, you should have to, have to write it in 24 hours. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really the time <laughs> the deadline. You After somebody calls you and says, yeah. oh my god, the right. school lunch policy is changing. Happened. You have 20, right. this just happened to me, you have 24 hours. Like, okay. You can't have, like, have like a drawer full of potential op-eds, unfortunately. Right. If yeah, only, could, because <laughs> those things are so shifting and they're so yeah. temporal, and that's like, there should be a class where you have to practice doing nothing but that. I really, like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how, what a skill that is to do, mm -hmm. to just have at your disposal, because that's a great way, like, that space brings it all together. And it's just a kind of fleeting, very temporary thing, right, in op-ed, there's, there's some every day, but that's part of how to get to influencers and how to tie them to the academy. That's like a very generative space. And then the other thing to me is um, some kind of requirement about experiential learning or getting into the community and out of the classroom. And it could be to perform specific kinds of activism or just even to interview people. I mean, I'm, I make students in my writing class go and interview somebody who works in the world of food in the community. And I have to build up to an entire semester to get them to do it. A lot of times they've never, I mean, they're, they're seniors is mostly who's in that writing seminar, but they've never really had to do it. They don't know how to even set up an interview. Well, can I just email them? Can I call them? What are the questions that I have to ask? I mean, there's so much coaching that has to go into that that it has opened my eyes to how difficult it is to get people just to kind of have, you, it is possible to get your PhD without ever having to talk to another person. Mm -hmm. Or you can spend the entire time in the library. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, in ter if you want to write for the publics, and publics, and I think you're right to differentiate. I think that's super important. Then you have to be able to get out into the world. And graduate school is very uh, geared a lot of times toward getting in you know, it drives you in instead mm. of. No, I entirely agree with Kelly. I think um, so many people don't know how to speak to each other or look at each other. And I think it also has to do with the age, right, in the age of iPhones and Twitter and Facebook um, and being able to sort of communicate digitally and not have to sit down one-on-one. -on -one. 
and have sort of those interpersonal connections with each other. Uh, it would be great to have a class, I think. I mean, just like building on the op-ed, it would be great to have a class like dedicated to different forms of writing, right? So that the op-ed would be like a week or two weeks, right? Um, I had one professor in my, in my exams uh, portfolio force us all to do that, force us all to write an op-ed. But we had never done the op-ed, right? We had no training. We just were like, okay, we need to read a ton and then we just have to figure out how to do it. Um, and luckily there was something that was, you know, really catching to write upon, but, uh, to have like that training to think about, you know, I was like, when I was writing the op-ed, I was thinking back to when I was in college and thinking about my lead and like every, you know, and it's really beneficial to think about longer forms of writing, right? If, if it's an op-ed or if it's a magazine piece or if it's like a news, you know, I think it would be really, you know, like a blog post. I mean, I really do think it would be beneficial to have a whole class on for, on different forms of writing and even sort of different ways to exhibit your writing, right? Um, different platforms, right? Um, well, especially because there's a multiplication of platforms now. I mean, it's right. the interesting thing about, the, yeah. public, about right. digital, about the digital is that the, the space for long form writing has actually expanded right. in sort of ways, right? That, right. Which is kind of interesting. And, th and that there's, and I think academics are actually often really well placed to write the kind of 3,000 word idea piece that places are, wait, are looking for, for yeah. instance. Um, but, and there is, I mean, for those of you who are probably familiar with the Op Ed Project, which is this yeah. great, this yeah. great kind yeah. of group that kind of goes yeah. and does workshops. And I mean, so many, so many people have really. I, mean, I think that has done had a huge impact, but there's yeah. no, but so there's something in place already to figure out. I mean, they have an idea yeah. of how you teach someone to go from not knowing how to do this to yeah. how to um, do it. Yeah. And it's such a math problem. It's like, how can I fit in Michelle Obama and biopolitics and Foucault into 700 words and make this argument I really want to make about regulating school lunch? It's <laughs> <laughs> so fun. And really I know that sounds problem. really yeah. nerdy, but it was like the best exercise mm -hmm. to figure out how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But I think so much of the so much of the work that we do in graduate school is thinking about things like Foucault and power and agency and and yet we all talk about it up here, right? And never what it looks like on the ground. And I think that's why being able to go into communities and speak to people um, is so important. So I don't really know what that class would look like, mm -hmm. but it would be you know sort of what Kelly said, where where we think about different ways that people are learning about yeah. these like big theories, right? And actually putting them in, yeah. um, executing them. Yeah. I had a question about, you know, I feel like some of us maybe in this room are trying to go in like an opposite direction from where you guys have gone, where you've kind of started with the more public journalistic writing and then come into the academy. Um, others of us, I mean, for me personally, part of the push outside, of, it's twofold. One is that I've done a research project where I've surveyed over 1,500 people, and they seem a lot more interested sometimes than in what I'm trying to do than my academic peers. And I also feel a lot more interested sometimes in speaking to them than I do my colleagues. Um, which makes, you know, and, and you know, we're all in kind of a vulnerable, liminal space professionally where we don't really know where this is going to go. And our advisors, as we've alluded to, may say, like, this is the advice I have to give you because, you know, as one professor told me recently, like, I can only help you the way I know how to help you. Um, it's not really helpful when you're in a place like me where it's like, well, I don't really know yet what my next job is. And this book could, that I've been working on could be a trade book. Or it could be, but the whole we mentioned the, the issue of channels and your you know your habits and that whole world of like looking outside into other channels is like really intimidating. I think for a lot of us who have, who have really learned to write and done our projects within the academy, and now it's like and you mentioned we could write a three thousand word long form journalism piece, or we could write a trade book about what we've been doing. But like, how do we even start to explore that is like really intimidating. So I was wondering if maybe you could offer some, some guidance for those of us trying to like look at for it from the other side. Do you want me to? I mean, I'll, say, I'll say one thing, which is I think that the kind of, um, I think it's a great, I mean, I think that it's, it's important to keep that front and center. And I think that more and more younger scholars, I and mean, I'm thinking of there's a younger, you know, a pretty young scholar who just won the National Book Award for, 
for a book that's their first book, right? Um, and, uh, and, and in some ways, it gets weird vibes about that from academic colleagues who are older, right? Like, yep. oh, I guess you think you're, you know, right? You're like, but at the same time, you have to say, that's great, you know? That's, it's an impressive achievement. And, and there's no reason, I mean, I don't, that doesn't have to be everyone's ambition, but there's no reason that, that even the first book couldn't, can't be a trade book, I think. I mean, I know that many people will say, the, the, the reason, the frustration I have with the kind of mentorship response is it's this kind of thing like we must as if as if we we're truly in a panopticon where we have no control over you know so <laughs> senior senior people at, at prestigious universities saying like I can't do anything about this you know right like why not why couldn't you <laughs> why couldn't you do something about it right in that sense it's kind of but I also think that the um, and the trade sort of the trade publishing world so I've written books both with academic and trade presses and also a lot of academic presses that have basically a trade orientation for a big chunk of their I mean, UNC's, UNC Press, to some extent, like exists now because they publish great food books. This is Southern their best-selling book you know? ever of all and time. So the UNC Press whole... is Mama Dip's cookbook. Just FYI, exactly. it's the best book they've wow. ever, ever, ever made or sold of all that whole university press. It's, that pays that, for like, that book. All their Caribbean history books. You know? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. No, that. But, yeah, and the, and most presses have that. They have that agenda now. They understand that they're going to have to have trade trade things so that so that they continue their mission of publishing academic books that they also believe in. Um, but I think that there's a, yeah, so there's spaces there, but even the, the university presses are interested in books that can reach a broader audience, actually. So in, in some ways, writing a kind of more trade-oriented book is sometimes a great way to get a book contract, to be honest. I mean, that's very different from the journal world, which is a very different, you know, kind of market. So, but anyway, you wanted to say something. I just, when I found, my advisor is an amazing anthropologist, life-changing person in my life. But when I discovered that as the editor-in-chief of the journal Cultural Anthropology, she didn't get paid, and my jaw just hit the ground. I was like, what? You do all of that for free? Like, people often used to ask me about writer's block, and my response was like, people have to worry about paying their rent. Yeah. Aren't worried about writer's block, right? Like, when I was, like, a young yeah. freelance writer in New York City, I just did not have time for writers but like I had to keep on figuring out how I was going to sell stories so that's a different conversation but what I can tell you is that people in journalism want you you're an expert you're doctor and in me I'm always looking for how I get I come from that mentality so I'm always looking for how I get the most value out of whatever I write so I had to write an academic paper that proved that I understood um, Marx's theory of value and so what I wrote about was plates Something I know about, plates, fiesta ware plates, and how they acquire value, and how people trade them and collect them and sell them at yard sales in different places, and I use them as my example of value. And I had to, for this academic paper, really prove that I understood a certain exchange value versus utility, right? And so um, I then took that paper, and I thought, well, I've spent weeks and weeks on this. I really need to make some money. <laughs> so how am I going to turn this into an article? How can I describe this theory and keep what is there and put in some more description about the plates and the experience of hunting for them in the market? And I, I did it, and I want to try to sell it even one more time in a different version. But this is all to just say that, like, that is my thinking always anyway, because I had it was the sunk cost of the time I had spent invested in it. But, it, like, literally the nuts and bolts of how to sell a story is that, you know, I would just would encourage you to knock on their doors. I want to write an op-ed about X. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? I Go figure out who you want to write for. Because they really will be very open to you, much more so than somebody who I used to be, somebody without a doctorate, who is a, like right. a dime a dozen food writer, right? Like that's a lot of people in the world take pictures of their cupcakes mm -hmm. on Instagram, right? So like, <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, I would uh, work backwards and figure out the publication that you want to write for and knock on their door. Because mm -hmm. they need content. It's just true. Right. They're looking for content, and they're looking for experts. They're looking for content that they can explain to their readers, why are you writing this? Right. And a very easy way to do that is say you're an expert on X, right? And they, right. I mean, the places like Slate or a lot of these places, really, they really yeah, like that because yeah. that's what reader, because reader has to be like, why is this person's essay on this mean anything to mm -hmm. me? You know, and 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 the content, the digital creates. The, there's a need for content. Now, the pay is not always great, <laughs> but, but it's existing. But it exists. <laughs> but, it, but but you know, I mean, so and I think and I mean, here's another little thing that I would say. This is both true, I think, for social media and for these sorts of things. That it's very, it's become very clear to me that when I write something for a place like Slate or my academic colleagues read that, whereas my books. Not sure, you know, like, I mean, my, the people in my area read it, but they know that I wrote books. But the number of people who, who 
who talk to me at conferences about something that they read, you know what I'm saying? So actually, uh, there's actually, I think, professional benefits that go with it too that I think are acknowledged, right? Just because, of course, people are interested in, um, anyway, so. Can I ask you a question about, it's sort of a collaboration question, and how collaboration may, uh, you know, even with writing a monograph, right, an excerpt monograph, there is collaboration that comes usually more towards the end, right, with your publisher and the copy editor and all that. So, uh, a couple of years ago um, at UNC, um, so, some of the faculty were able to get Elaine, oh, what's her name? Mason, she, Elaine Mason, right? No, no, not, not, the, not the one at UNC Press. This one had a similar name. Okay. <laughs> but she was Stephen Greenblatt's editor. So she was down from Norton and she swung by and she gave us a talk about you know academics trying to write for trade. And the thing she said that completely threw me for a loop, but I hadn't realized, just hadn't realized, was that she said that if you really aspire to get your book picked up by a trade press, you cannot be too far into it when you approach a publisher. She yes. said that you, mm -hmm. it's okay to approach them with an introduction yeah. or a concept, and the idea that the editor wants to have much more creative. Sure. And I guess, you know, does that raise interesting questions for scholars? Because, you know, I, I think the initial impulse would be, well, wait a minute, you know, this is about the discipline Why? and the academy, yeah. and yeah, who are you to, like, let the market determine what I write? I'm not going to be to. So I have sold, a, like, a lot of food books, cookbooks, like supporting myself as a ghostwriter, and it, the process is just entirely different. Your, yeah. your proposal is an idea that comes with a suggested table of contents, and maybe a lot of times they'll ask you for a sample chapter. But they do not want to see an entire manuscript, because mm -hmm. that suggests, I am finished, and I have nothing, you, you, you're out of a job. Right. That's not how it right. works in the other side, right? And they do pay attention to the market, and the reason they do is because they pay you, like a lot more, and yeah. there, that comes with Another thing to trade, right? That's not, that's a, just a different sort of editorial relationship entirely mm -hmm. than the academic press. When we think about like, the, the publishers as gatekeepers as opposed to, like, you know, with, with a monograph, it's more about, you know, the, the, the academic peer review and maybe your institution advisor at an early stage. It's, it doesn't kind of turn up. I mean, out. I'll just, this is maybe a slightly heretic. It's, for one thing, the trade writing to me is a much more sane process than, like, you just spent 10 years writing a, a monograph. Then you send it to two reviewers who sort of like randomly, based on if you're, you know, like can sort of ask you to make all these changes. And sometimes the editor, I mean, then you have to change it and adjust to that after the fact. There's a way in which it can be very, sometimes it's great and it can be very productive if the editor has chosen the right readers, but it can sometimes be very vexed, as anyone who's published mm -hmm. an academic book knows, you know. And academic articles can often be a similar type of, like just the psychological weight. Versus when I wrote a trade book, it's true that I would be terrified when my phone rang and it was my editor, after I sent her my chapter the week before and she was like, this isn't working for me, you know, like this kind of. On the other hand, by the time I was writing the fourth, fifth, sixth chapters of the book, I really knew what I was doing. And I think partly it's just, it is surrendering but every, it's kind of understanding that every book is a different you, you know? Like, I don't think, I don't have like an authorial voice that I will have my whole life that, you know, I was born with or something. I mean, every book that I write will have. And so the, to work with an editor who has, you know, who pushes you in some interesting direction is, is great, right? So I think, but that does go very much against the grain of a certain sense of academic professional branding where you, it's this very different ethos, right? Where you like have a set of ideas that maybe you're gonna become identified with theoretical intervention so there is a there is a real conflict there i think um yes i but. just went through my first peer review process for an article for an uh and it was just really intense <laughs> that's all i can say it's still it's ongoing it's like a dialogue with some strangers who are yelling at me <laughs> right, yeah. why are you yelling at me i, don't I can't know speak you back to you meaningfully <laughs> you it's don't know who really they are. <laughs> 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 yeah. Because when you think about a humanities undergraduate education, especially, I mean, we just never talk about content and the world wanting content. It's like, you know, media and its periods and the ways that we organize what is basically a vast sea of content that we are, are really expert in. Um, doesn't connect to, to this kind of idea. So I wondered if you could talk about. The, the commercial uh, appetite for content and humanities education, and whether there's any way to create a sort of pedagogical um, portals between what we do currently and that kind of question. Do your, when you've been writing class to the students, like share that with some public in some way or another, in the form of blogs or, I mean, have either of you taught that in that way? 
you know, in, yeah. yeah like so the, in students... my, in my teaching, yes, all of my students have shared it. Uh, so I actually uh, collaborated with two other professors in the Latino studies program here, and they actually presented their work. Uh, so they were able to, in a symposium that we set up, they were able to talk about their work with their peers. And for some of them, they were intro. A lot of them were intro students. It was like their first year um, here at Duke. And they had never had the opportunity to present research, right, that they had done um, or sort of done and then presented it with their colleagues. Um, and so for them, it became a very, it became a, a learning experience, even how they trim down like a, a paper for class versus what they're going to present, right? To take the things that excite them most about their project and condense that right into a, a presentable uh, medium. And I've had students do blog posts as well during um, like the course of the year to relate like the stories, the, the history that we're reading about with current events. Um, and so when I was teaching, uh, was when Trayvon Martin was shot and killed. Um, and so they talked about like racialization and criminalization, right, in their blog posts. Um, and so I've tried to incorporate them to think about, you know, ways that they can think about what we're learning about in like the present day as well, right, in terms of like, what are we learning about as, as historians and how can we place that today? Um, so I think it's also been helpful for them to understand like why history matters, right? Um, as, as they, yeah. mm -hmm. I've done, I mean, I did something similar in the soccer politics class yeah. where the students write for a blog. And of course, soccer, like food, is like a thing about for which there's an endless appetite for content basically yeah. in the world. Yeah. So when students write blog posts or projects that are on this blog, like they get read by a lot of people because people are basically constantly searching for, right? So we had one students do just a really, really good study of how the referees are picked for the World Cup, which is an interesting <laughs> topic and a topic that people Google a lot during the World Cup, like how the hell did the, you know, yeah, essentially. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? But I think the, maybe the more interesting one that in that Yuri was involved in this Borders Beyond the Border project, but this last yeah. semester we had Joan Clifford and Deb Reisinger in their classes. Um, had their students work on kind of immigrant communities in North Carolina, but then we partnered them with journalists so that they wrote pieces for the new, for the local newspaper. So in Deb, Deb's class wrote eight pieces for the Durham Herald Sun about uh, African resettled refugees in Durham, just like, I mean, so they and they, and that was another case. The local newspapers were actually very eager for mm -hmm. content about something like that. They had never run a series about Africans in Durham, right? Um, and yet they were excited to. Right. And then also Que Pasa, which is this, yeah, the Spanish, this Spanish, Spanish language. language. So Spanish students at Duke wrote articles for the Spanish language newspaper, which was a great exercise for their Spanish, obviously, and high stakes. Um, but that was a kind of, I mean, it was, it was Deb and Joan who came up with this idea. We were thinking about getting stuff in the New York Times and stuff, which would all be great. Um, but in a sense, the local newspapers are a great place for that. And that was, I think, so there's, I think there's a lot of space for that where, um, because again, they and they don't have the staff to do investigative reports on you know what it means to be a Malian immigrant. I mean, they don't speak French. You know, right. there's so the, suddenly that there was an undergraduate group of students who spoke a language, just spoke a language already gave them expertise and ability to go into homes. You know, with the proper framing and everything. Right. But but and I would imagine you could do similar things. There is um, an editor that I have worked with, who now works for a website called the Daily Meal. It's a property of Forbes. It's mm -hmm. Forbes has a huge like online channels and it's basically the food channel of Forbes it's called the Daily Meal. And so these ingredient papers I had my students write were all submitted because mm -hmm. they need the Daily Meal just needs tons of content. So my students didn't get paid, but the editors there reviewed all their papers. They responded to each student with how to make those publishable. And it, several of them are mm -hmm. online. So there, I mean, and including really one of them that was just like amazing. Um, a woman, a student, a student of mine who's now in nursing school, she's amazing, wrote a paper about brown sugar and brown women's bodies. And it was an incredible political paper about food. And it became an article on the Daily Meal, and then it was picked up, and she won a big award from the Rubenstein Library here for that. So it was like, oh, I felt, <laughs> I felt, <laughs> I felt great for her about that project. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what you're saying, like, creating a portal between content needers and academics who could provide it. The space is like wide open for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think this question is primarily for Yuri, but I, I'd be interested in what the other, uh, what Laurent and Kelly have to say as well. 
Um, so we've been talking a lot about writing. I know this is a writing workshop, but I know you're also an activist and you work with school groups and so on. So can you talk a little bit about, I know you came from activism into academia, but that reverse translation, taking your academic work and translating it back into the activist circles, into the classrooms that you're engaging with, what is that process like for you? Um, hi, Brian. Um, I think for me, um, I am really happy to be able to do that uh, to be um, to be in that position, to be able to to sort of communicate different ideas um, to different groups of people that I work with, especially young students, um, because I see my experiences very much reflected in theirs, especially here in Durham um, and in the public schools, right? And so, um, I think in a lot of ways, for me to sort of think about the work that I do, right, in terms of like race and immigration and criminalization, illegality. Um, a lot of times what I do is a very sort of collective learning exercise, right, where I just, I tell people to tell me their stories, right, or ask me, like it, it's, they're, they are the experts in the room, right? Like, no, and, and I can study it my whole life and I still will not know what it is to be undocumented because I'm not undocumented, right? Certainly I have family members that are, people that I love that are, but I will never be that expert, right? And so some of these students that I work with are, and they're the ones that can really tell me, right? Like I can certainly have studied this for years, have studied migration and the politics of it, how neoliberalism and all these things affect it, right? But these students are living it day in and day out. And so for them to sort of talk about their lived knowledge, um, and their cultural competency, and then for me to say, yes, that's exactly it. So if we think about this experience, you know, within this broader framework, and so I, I do it in a very sort of collective way. And I think, I think teaching has helped me, right, to think about, and even to think about the ways that I've I've learned most effectively um, has been in sort of this like even in graduate school setting where it's a very much a collective. I do that with young students as well, right, and. And oftentimes the best way to engage people is to figure out what they like the most, right? So I work with History Day students in North Carolina um, and ask them what they care about. What are the things that they care about, right? And build from there. Um, because you need to have, you know, the, for them really to get involved in like a project, a history project that they're going to do, they have to care about it and want to do it, right? Want to research it. Um, and so I think even, you know, when I'm in, in schools and then when I'm working with like immigrant communities and even in my church, so much of it is trying to think about the knowledge they already have, right? Um, and really sort of honoring that and being very intentional about that. Um, and then sort of, you know, bridging out, you know, together in sort of these larger, you know, terms um, that we're more sort of used to in the academic world. But. I have a question on the mediums um, that we choose, and you guys have spoke to many, to reach the public. And I'm interested in your community work, um, if the publics themselves have expressed or shared their thoughts on the mediums that would work for, what, for, for their, what their purpose is or what they're trying to get across. So for instance, have they shared that, okay, social media is the way to go, or no, I need to be present in this space wherever this topic is talked about um, to share my story myself, or what, are, what have they shared as the the medium that they think is is um, the best to kind of convey their story. Or if it varies or, um, you know, I was just thinking of, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's interesting because in the Borders Project, we've been talking about the need to maybe do print, you know, to take the articles in Spanish, print yep. them, make them available, right? There's a way in which the the, the sort of the, um, the internet mm -hmm. is not necessarily a great tool for a lot of people who don't you know, really just don't have access or easy access to this. And we assume, you know, there's a kind of assume. So it's interesting to, I mean, it's just really important to think about that. What, yeah. what is the form of access? Right. Right, right. So for, for my, like for the little mini documentaries that I did, one of them was just much more broad than the other. The, the feast day of La Virgen was much uh, more broad than the actual like indigenous community with which I've been working um, in my dissertation. And so be, because of this particular indigenous community that's autonomous, 
um, now from the government. They are experts in documentaries um, because people have been filming them and they've been, you know, and they've been filming each other for many years. Uh, so they love documentaries and they love talking about mm. what they were able to do in their indigenous community as far as being autonomous in Mexico. And so when I approached them and said, you know, because I've already, I have a relationship with them. I've interviewed them for my oral histories. When I approached them about doing this type of project, they were actually really happy because most of their families do have the internet at mm -hmm. home, right? Or at least on their cell phones, they have smartphones. And so they're able to see like that mm -hmm. documentary that like that was in, right? And so they're really happy about that. Um, but even when we were done with the filming and the editing, the translations, uh, that I did, I showed it to them, right? And I'm like, look, look at this. What do you think about this? Mm. What do you think about the way that I'm, you're being portrayed? Um, so I think, I, you know, as an oral historian, it's hard because I'm sort of taking these stories and then using them in my dissertation for, for a particular narrative that I'm trying to tell. Um, and, in, and in this, um, in, and I always feel, you know, very weird about that and I also try to do a lot of the same things with my own chapters is like look this is what I'm using your story to tell right so in in this medium that is easily accessible to them uh you know who work construction like 12 hours a day right they can just check it on their phone during their lunch break uh, they were able to say no Yudi it's it looks good it looks great like this is awesome when can I share the links you know when can I show my family so one of the things that there is going to be really important is to be able to translate sort of the written piece that I wrote into Spanish as well so that their family can also read that, right? Um, and so we could even, you know, promote it a, sort of in a, to a much broader audience that's also Spanish speaking, right? Because the video, the audio itself is in Spanish and translated into English. Um, but that's been one of the ways in which I try to be very sort of intentional in, in allowing people that opportunity. Like if they're providing me, they're sharing with me their stories, I try to be as generous with them and in, in talking about the ways that we're going to go about sort of highlighting them, right, and honoring them. And some of this too is kind of about who you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. You know, are you, are you writing to inform? Are you writing to enlighten? Who are you writing to enlighten? And then... How, how that's going to work. Like her community involvement is amazing, but it's not necessarily the kind of thing that I'm after. Like I'm trying mm -hmm. to change food lunch policy in North Carolina, which is right. like, I might as well just hit my head on the desk, but I've got some ways. I'm trying to, I'm trying to speak to the state house. And the mm -hmm. way that I'm trying to do that is by forcing them to look at this school lunch contractor here. So I'm not, I need principals to cooperate with me to let me into the lunchroom to eat the lunch and take pictures of it. But I'm not writing for them. I mean, I'm writing, I hope, to help them, but I'm not, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm trying to reach somebody who doesn't really want to pay attention to me. So yeah. my idea is like, how am I going to get that going as opposed to like, they're interested in what I have to say and they'll take a look at it, but really what I need for them to do is give me access, yeah. which is a different problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different issue is the writer's like, can you please let me in and let me eat lunch, even though I'm really not supposed to come in there and take pictures. But then I can say, hey, Chartwell, this is like what you call chicken, and there's no chicken. It's just a piece of bone. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> well, chicken bone lunch. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but they're just like, oh, sorry, you got a bad one. Like, no, no, no. But that's it. But it's, I'm not... My community dialogue is just very, it's a different engagement. Yeah, exactly. And there's probably a whole different register that you're working in. Yeah. Well, I think, and this video case is a really great one in a separate right? Because we didn't, going into it, didn't know what what's the audience for this video exactly. And it yeah. can be multiple audiences, but in some ways the most exciting thing is this relationship, right? In other words, right. it doesn't have to have three million views on, you know, no, but it's right. in a sense that it has, a, that, is a, that it can be a form of communication. Yeah. I and I think it is also, um, just to talk about, what it means to be Mexican, and it's mm -hmm. not what everybody thinks it exactly. means, right? It's just, it's um, yeah. And it's and it's sort of thinking about like the lived indigenous communities that continue to to mm -hmm. move and migrate, just as everybody else does, right? And I think uh, it could definitely spun in a political moment, right? Or these stories mm -hmm. could definitely be used because I do use a lot of them um, 
in sort of the political work that I do, right, in different ways. But it's true. It, it all depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish, right, and who it is you want to read, forced to read, right, forced to be at the table. The video and the blog post are on the FF, the Forum for College and Public's website. Now. Yeah, see, it's a you plug. Can see, you can see, but it's great. I mean, I think, and it was she, plug. Yuri worked Shameless with plug. Natalie, our video person. But the team effort. Yeah. It was a team effort. But, uh, but it's beautiful. I mean, it yeah. really is, and it's kind of, yeah, so. Uh, just in terms of with two right curricular stuff, one thing my advisors had me do, I'm in, in the process of framing my dissertation question, um, and um, he's going to have me come into his master's level class next year and present it um, and see. And I'm so I'm in religion, I do kind of historical, literary, social work on um, first century Christianity. This is difficult students. A tiny fraction of whom want to be academics, the vast majority of whom want to get advanced degrees and right. go do ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in a way, that's that's kind of this meaning of the public and the, and the academic. They're getting an academic degree, but they don't want to use it in the academy. Um, so that for me has been a really interesting exercise. On you know, I'm going to present this at the conferences. I hope, but how does how does it play in the fiscal classroom? All right, does it does it fit just? Yeah, and just that question of what's the op what's the entr what's the invitation in? Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes the way I put this, there's there, it's there is in in some ways. And I think you mentioned this too in our correspondence that there sometimes there's actually it's not just that academic writing and public writing are different. They actually in some ways have they're sometimes opposed to each other, and they're opposed to each other in one particular way, which is that a piece of public writing, the opening is supposed to be as as welcoming as possible to anyone. Yeah. You know, it's basically like a huge welcome. Yeah. You have to write a beginning that's basically like. Anyone's welcome here, you know? Yeah. Come on in. That's right. I mean, that's what Elite is, essentially. Yeah. Please Ooh, enter my piece. That's and right. you have a million competing interests or something. It's like, let me hold you for a minute instead right. of Just you looking please. at your phone. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So it has to be. And of course, the, for the most part, often an open, uh, certainly an opening of an academic article is actually weirdly closing, right? I mean, in other words, usually the beginning is to sort of say, to, to sort of mention a debate. Or, right, and I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying this, they can both have their value, yeah. but the point is to sort of signal to the person whether they should keep reading in some ways, right? Like, and, and that, there are people who do that just differently, but a lot of times that's, and that's what a lot of journal editors will ask you to do, right? The first, the beginning of, is the piece is to situate it within the literature. Totally logical, right? But what it does mean is that if you're not situated in the literature, you tend to often feel like, not really sure I should, am I invited into this? You know, do I have to go read a bunch of other things first? Or there's a kind of strain. So there's, and those are very different, those are very different actions for the opening. And an op so the opening as a kind of, and if you think about it, it's really interesting. I mean, Adrian, let's the colleague in history. This has people, like, you just read introductions of books, right? Yeah. And it's very interesting to think what an introduction to an academic book is and should be. And again, the thing about, the, the curious thing is that when you go to publish an, a book with a university press, they're always thinking now, you know, can I sell, can I sell 3,000 of these, right? It's not, we're not, they don't have to sell a million, but they have to, and, and the openings are really important for that, right? Yeah. And it's, and the opening has to be something that, and sometimes it's just like as an undergrad, can I assign this to an undergraduate class? Which is exactly the same That's problem, right? right? It's the same question, right? Like, does, is the undergraduate going to be like, attention. I don't know what to do with this, or are they yeah. going to be like, this is kind of interesting, right? Yeah. So I just think it's kind of intriguing. The, the book, the book publisher, we, ha we haven't had enough of a discussion about that, but I think that the in, in academia in general, that actually the, the press, the presses, and we talk to editors, are are interested in in, in people who've learned how to write an opening, and I'm sure the way you've been trained. You know, Right, yeah. it's like you write this. You write the anecdotal lead. You have to write a hook that's going to make yeah, somebody keep reading you. You start with an anecdote, and so then cool. right, you start with people. You set a scene, and mm -hmm. then you can pull back and say, in this article, I'm going to tell you about X, Y, and Z. Right. right? Except, like, right in in the academy, this is like not not done. And I don't know if you know the philosopher Liz Gross. She's here. She's a feminist philosopher. She's in women's studies at Duke. She's a totally amazing thinker. But I wrote a paper for her about. Um, the class was called Time and Becoming. It was about Darwinian evolutionary theory and feminist philosophy. I was writing about the paleo diet, and I started with an anecdotal lead. And she wasn't just mad. She was furious. She was like, you cannot write like this. You cannot write an academic paper like this. And I, I, it was an excellent learning experience in this precise <laughs> lesson. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, let me rewrite that. Right. Can, can I ask a related question on that? It's like the, the place 
of you as the author. Like it seems like part of this welcoming is also to be like personable. Right. And then like the anecdote sure. is often you're in it and somebody else is in it. Like it's not just about you, it's like a navel gazing thing, but it's like you're a person who's gonna tell a story just to the reader who's also a person, you know, which just <laughs> feels very different from the way that academic writing is often done. This is one of the like, as I make these choices about like, what project am I trying to write? One of my concerns is I'm really in this story very much. Yeah. Mm. And it's kind of artificial for me to pretend like I'm not. Mm, right. But I feel professional professor pressure to make say I to yeah. pretend yeah. that. But I feel like it'll be a way better book if I am in it and would also be more interesting to somebody else. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that. I'm totally in mine. Um, and I, if you read any oral history, most of them are all anecdotal, right? And a lot of stories, a lot of people, a lot of I. I mean, I'm in it as much as I need to be and as much as because oral history is a product of two people, right? So they're responding to the questions that I'm posing. And then they're also responding to me. Mm -hmm. So when like these Latino families talk, you know, poorly about black people, it's because they see me as an insider, right? Or when they talk poorly about gringos, it's because they don't see me as an American. And so, so I'm as much a part of the story, right? As as theirs are, right? And they also see me as an insider that understands and doesn't need a lot of uh, sort of all the, this other cultural knowledge about their lives or, or what their lives have been like or the experience. And so um, I'm, I'm, the story isn't about me though, right? And so I always have to like refocus it on like, I'm in it as much as I need to be in it, right? But the way in which I am perceiving everybody that I'm talking to and describing them, because I do do a lot of that in my work. I describe how they're sitting and holding their hands or fidgeting or, and I do a lot of that um, just because it, you know, is, is sort of what they're feeling and the emotions that they're having at the moment, right? Um, and sort of when they are engaging with me in a very particular way, I mean, in some instances like that one, I do include myself in it, right? Like she said this because I had, right? And she, because she perceived me in that way. But I try not, I think, so for me, I think you have to tell the story that's like most um, interesting to you and the people that you're writing about, to be honest, because I think if you do that, it's, it's going to be, inter I mean, maybe you're just not talking to the right colleagues, right? Or the right people. Because I think if you do, sort of tell the story that you want to tell and the one that makes the people you surveyed excited and you excited and that's at the end that's the story that's going to make you the most happy right um and so a lot of my colleagues are not writing their dissertations like I am right but I'm writing my dissertation yeah, sure. <laughs> and so um and like I said in oral history you know I guess we're lucky in that sense that a lot of people you know talk about their roles and the stories that they're writing about, right? And I think in some ways, even as any type of a story, and you're in it in some ways, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I just think that, like, the focus needs to not be on you, but I think in the in the ways that you need to be in the story to tell some part of it, yeah. then you, should, you shouldn't be scared of that. And I will, t I agree with you, and I will elaborate it just a second, which is to say this comes up all the time. I think it's, like, this idea that any story is objective is mm -hmm. sort of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, but but move, I mean, to not even debate that, you know, it's really important in anthropology that you were there, right? It's participant <laughs> observation. So, it's the only reason. Right. The only reason. Yeah. So, anybody's pretending they weren't is sort of like against the, uh, that's very confusing anyway. But to, I'm, when you say I'm in there as much as I need to be, that's exactly right to me. Mm -hmm. And and what it means is like it's important to the reader to know that I know this because I saw it or because right. I heard it or because someone said it to me. That's how I know. That's mm -hmm. how I've acquired this knowledge. But then the story's never about me. Right. I was there and I am already in it, but it isn't my story. So what mm -hmm. I generally try to do is situate it to let you know, the reader, like, yes, I heard this. Yes, I was there. And then I get myself out of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think it's quite important to establish that, like, of, of course, I was there and this person said this to me. And then I went to so-and-so. I mean, there are times when writing around it is actually more difficult yeah. than yeah. just saying hi, more. right? Yep. I mean, I think that the key is to figure out, this is back to the curriculum question, there's just different ways of doing this, right? And it depends on the book. I mean, I've written books where I'm not present at all. And I think that's the right choice, you know, about the Haitian Revolution, or, you know, things. And then I've written <laughs> other books where I'm pretty present. And... Um, 
or the, my banjo book, I appear once, you know, but it's, but it was important to me and I think it's important where, so it just, I think, and there's just a lot of different ways to do it and then anthropologists have different ways to do it. I always think of the, the book, this book by Karen McCarthy Brown, which is called Mama Lola, which is, I think, one of the most popular academic books, you know, in existence, as far as I can tell. I mean, UC Press sells, and it's totally experimental. It's like half of the chapters are written in fiction. It's super long and still people use it in classes. Um, and it's, it's striking that it's actually a very, very successful book, and yet there's almost no sense that that could be a model for anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Even though, right? And I can understand that. I mean, Sidia Hartman is another example, right? I can understand that because the part of the challenge is it's much harder to do that well in some ways. It's very hard to do that well and not to end up being, right? There's a, there's a, so I think, but we do have to have models for it. And I think it's useful just to think about whether you're going to be the narrator. It's not like, Exactly. It's not like your whole self is going to be right, there. Right. But are you occasionally going to put yourself in there the way that a, a, maybe a novelist might sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? Because, but as ultimately as part of the literary project of, of writing your book, right, in a certain way. And I think that's, that's, that's the key. But to do that, you'd have to have examples of how to do it. Instead of being told you're not allowed to, it'd be like, okay, you need to do it. So how do you do it well? The one, the one I think of is Methland. I don't know if everybody's heard of this book. It's this book about the meth epidemic in the Midwest. Nick. Nick yeah, he, and he's, he's at St. Louis, University of St. Louis or something, and he very much tells the story as like a journey, like his journey to understand what's going on mm -hmm. in this scenario. And then that takes him, you know, to this town and these relationships with these people, but then it also takes him to investigating, like learning about the Mexican drug cartels and how they work and all this stuff. Right. So it's it like to, to draw together all the themes that he's trying to get, he almost has to tell it as a mm -hmm. journey. So that, anyway, that's a model that I'm playing with is like the themes and the content, like tying that together yeah. as a sort of journey to try to understand something. Yeah. And it depends on disciplines and so forth. But yeah, I think, right. I mean, Yuri's point was like, it's your dissertation, you know? And so, and it's hard enough to write a dissertation just period, right? Without like kind of loving and be inspired by it. So, I mean, on some level, like if formal experimentation is part of it and you know, you can always edit things at some point. I always, I often think of the story that in a book that I, I wrote a book about soccer um, and in it, I wrote a paragraph which is basically written from the perspective of a car that's gonna be about to be burnt. You know, in France, they burn cars very often. And whatever, for some reason I was inspired to write. And I wrote that paragraph, and I remember that the editor at the press, at, this is University of North Carolina, uh, sorry, of California Press, but who wanted a trade book, was like, when I read that, I knew this was going to be really good. We could sell it to a broad audience. And so that was like, the, in some ways, and the same, the, the academic reviewers that were sent to were said, like, this is generally really good, but that paragraph has to go. <laughs> you cannot have that in the book. You know, it's outrageous to sort of, and I was like, I was like, so that, but this is, this is a university press editor and a university press re reviewer, and they just had different, really different agendas. Yeah. I left it in, so just so you know. But like, <laughs> so, yes, but I think exactly. it, that's an interesting case that, yeah. um, that it was, but it, and it, well, a lot of the book is actually written in a fairly, it's not that experimental, right? But there are just a couple moments. Partly it's about letting your readers breathe a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the piece, I mean, we talked about a piece that I wrote for Slate, which was about Brus the bombing in Brussels, right? There's a book, the thing that I wrote, the guy literally wrote to me because he, he knew me, he had someone told me, Sorry, he kind of knew about me from other things, and he also knew I was born in Belgium. Like, that was my qualification. Um, and I knew some things about the city, but it was a very important piece for me to write. I wrote it relatively quickly, and it was sort of, it was autobiographical and so forth, but it was allowing, it was just to kind of experiment, but it was really nice to be able to do something like that. Um, and it was, in some ways, my academic training, which is about sort of culture and migration. Like, in all kinds of ways, I couldn't have done it without my academic training. But it wasn't like if I, if you ever asked me before then, are you a Brussels specialist? You know, I would have said, no, that has nothing to do with what I'm working on. But you see what I'm saying? So there's a way in which um, the moment of writing allows you to, to discover certain possibilities too. So You just have to make sure they sign off, you know? Your advisors, then you're good. <laughs> oh, okay. So there you go. Okay. It's going to be your big, your big money book. Yeah, the big money book. Um, well, I think we're running out of time. I don't know if you want to just say any more concluding comments. The one thing I would say is that um, people often ask people who write, like what they do, or then people will ask me, do you really write every day? And I just would say, yes, I do. I write every day. And if you want to be a writer, you should write every day. And it's a big pain. And even mm -hmm. if it's just a long letter to someone, I have checked it off. I have mm -hmm. spent some time in my life trying to be a better writer that mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. even small, because I 
one of you. You learn something each time you do it. Yeah. It's a practice. It's mm -hmm. not like something, I mean, it is also a muscle and you can not write for a while and you can get back on it and you'll be really rusty and stink. So if you just keep the muscle going, it does really work for me to keep practicing it and to look at it as a practice that I'm always practicing. Mm -hmm. And slash if you're say. reading a lot, right? Reading I a read lot, a lot. Read a lot. Write a lot yeah. and you will be a better writer. It's really... And everything will work out beautifully. No. Yeah. <laughs> everything will be fine. Well, thank you both very thank much. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.